I'm doing some wiring for the CNC and it's not much, just putting uh, ferrules and mold connectors on the ends of stuff, but there are a few things here that I think warrant a video. Now I'm working out here instead of back in the shop because I've noticed this weird thing that just every time I drop something small, like one of these little mulch pins, just before it hits the floor, a wormhole opens up and takes it off to another dimension. <laughs> and then it's gone, just gone forever. And it doesn't matter how long you look, you're not gonna find it because it simply isn't there anymore. And I'm 95% sure if I ever manage to follow one of these guys as it travels to the time-space continuum, I'll like pop out the other end in the Empire of Dirt and there will be every metric fastener I've ever dropped. Just <laughs> mountains and mountains of them. So if you've ever wondered where the shit you lose goes, that's my theory. Anyway, here's what we got. This is the twisted pair shielded cable that I showed in one of the earlier videos. The uh, shielding we'll talk about later, but the important thing for now is that it has four conductors that I'm using for power transfer between the drivers and the steppers. Uh, they're 18 gauge, which should be more than enough for the three amps these guys draw and shouldn't show any significant voltage drop. I picked this size mostly because it's a nice size. Uh, <laughs> Like the pigtails on here are 22 gauge, which just seems a little bit fragile to me, uh, whereas this is quite a bit more robust. But it's not so heavy that it won't be able to bend as the gantry is traveling back and forth. So that was the reason behind that decision. I put these uh, ferrules on the ends here, which are these little cylindrical crimps that you slip over the stripped wire and then crimp down with one of these tools. And it gives you a nice tight kind of square end that fits well into terminal blocks such as these. Because if you use the uh, stranded wire itself, just like twisted in a bundle, that's not the neatest installation. Um, like that can work itself loose over time. And if you uh, remove it and insert it multiple times, that can wear the copper out and make it get brittle. So it just begins, uh, you know, dropping and like breaking off the end. Or you can get, uh, you know, occasionally stray wires like this guy here. They kind of stick out to the side and short out another terminal. So the tool here was about 20 bucks and I got a lifetime supply basically of these ferrules for a few more bucks. So for not that much money, you can give yourself a cleaner installation. One thing I don't think I mentioned yet about these Wantai uh, DQ542MA drivers is the style of terminal block they use. Cause this here is called a Phoenix connector and it's a pluggable terminal block. So you can wire it up and then put it back into the driver. It's kind of nice because it means if your driver is installed in a control cabinet already, where it's like a confined space and you can't really get your screwdriver in there, you don't need to worry about it. You just unplug it, wire it up, and then plug it back in. Um, I will say though, the way they organize these plugs is kind of weird because here we have a four and a two, and then here we have a straight six. And I've already checked, you can't like swap them back and forth. There's a old divider here that kind of messes the spacing up. But uh, on the straight six, these two go to your power supply and these four go to your stepper. So this one plug goes two places. And here on the four and the two, this is all low voltage signaling. That either goes to your parallel port breakup board or your Arduino or your smooth stepper or whatever you're using for the control. So here we have one plug to two places and two plugs to one place. It seems a little bit backwards to me. <laughs> but you know, again, uh, Chinese import stuff, there is a reason why it's cheaper. If you've done any electronics before, you've probably noticed a lot of cables have this funny little thread in them, and you might have asked yourself what that's for. Well, it has three functions. Uh, for one, it's filler. It takes the space between the uh, insulation on the conductors and the jacket of the cable itself. Uh, secondly, this thread is usually Kevlar, so it gives the cable a bit more pulling strength. If you're trying to feed this guy through like 200 feet of conduit, a couple of turns, it takes a lot of pull to get it through. And having the uh, you know, Kevlar thread in there makes the cable a little bit less prone to breaking. And thirdly, you can actually use this to help you strip the cable. I've already come along uh, right around here and scored it lightly with the utility knife, but I haven't yet done anything else with the jacket. You see though, if I grab on the string and give it a pull, and that will actually cut through the jacket. And then I can come around and actually peel it where I scored it. Of course, doing this on camera, I'm not going to do it right because there we go. See? 
And that's a bit safer than actually taking the utility knife and scoring it all the way down, where that way you're a lot more likely to accidentally cut through the insulation of a con conductor. If you're not familiar with Molk's connectors, here is a closer look at the Minifit Junior Series. So here we have a female plug, a female pin, a male plug, and a male pin. So you crimp your wires uh, to these little plugs, get four of them, and insert them into the back of a female plug, and that's one half the connection, and then four wires crimped to four male pins, inserted to the back of the male plug, and that's half, that half the connection. So these female pins have kind of a tube shape, and that pushes out against the inside wall of each of these four plastic prongs. And then the male pins are just a spike, and they kind of float free inside of uh, this plastic housing. And these two pieces of housing are keyed in such a way, so you can only insert them together uh, right, in one direction, and every other direction doesn't fit. And it locks in place. And that is how you have your connection. Now, Molex is better known uh, for their use in computer power supplies, which would be these guys. A uh, slightly different type of Molex. These are your standard ones. These are Minifit Juniors. The difference uh, really is just the size, the form factor. Like, you know, these are smaller pins, Minifit Junior, right? <laughs> and those are standard, larger. Uh, these also have a higher amperage rating, believe it or not. Um, I just bought them more for, yeah, the form factor, um, and they seem like a slightly more durable plug than the uh, traditional Molex on the power supply there. But uh, both of them work generally the same idea with the tube and the spike, and then the plastic uh, bodies, you know, guiding the pins together. And they have the same style of crimping on the actual pins. Finicky little bastards. There we go. Okay, so here we have two sets of fins on the back, a tall one and a short one. And the tall one crimps on the insulation, and the short one crimps on the bare wire. And they are supposed to curl in and meet the middle, kind of forming an M shape. Uh, and then there's the wings right in front, which stick out to the sides, and they are what clips each of these in to the plastic body. Now actually doing a demo and like teaching you how to crimp those things is beyond this video, but there's plenty of others on YouTube. What I do want to show you is a tool I have for it and give you my feedback on it because I understand it's a pretty popular one. Uh, this is the IWIS SN28B. Um, I forget whether I bought it on eBay or Amazon, but I did buy it with my own money and it's maybe 15 or 20 bucks. Uh, the SN28B in the name is referring to the dies here, which are specifically for uh, Molex pins and I think a few other style pins that have the same fins that come in the M shape work with this as well. Uh, I've heard DuPont pins also work, maybe some others. I haven't tried them though. Now, my general impression of this tool is that it is well made, but it's not my favorite to use. Uh, it's a little bit finicky because it tries to crimp both the front and back sets of fins at the same time. You see here in the die, the bottom half has two different diameters of curve on it. And the top has two different sizes of M shape. So these different three indentations are for different gauges of wire, which are labeled here. You probably can't make them out in the video. Yeah, each different gauge. Um, but then the front and back are what take care of the fins themselves. So I just find it difficult to hold the pin in this guy while you shrink the wire in the correct position and then crimp it down, right? Because that's three things, only got two hands. So sometimes I have the problem where when I crimp the pin, I either get uh, insulation crimped on the front set of uh, fins here or bare wire on the back. And either of those two things gives you a, a more shoddy crimp that's you know prone to pulling apart or just not having a good connection. And you can kind of get around that by like feeding the pin in and then either going to one click or maybe two clicks to hold the pin in place and then feed the wire in after it. Then that way the uh, crimper will hold the pin for you while you're dealing with the wire. But then with the width of this die, I find it hard to really see you know, how far in the wire is. 
So I kind of wish I had a tool instead that would only crimp either the front or the back set of fins at one time, letting you set it up a bit more nicely and see what you're doing a bit better. You know, this does definitely work. You know, the die is made very nicely. I've seen some photos of other uh, SN28B dies that barely had any, uh, you know, shape to them at all. So they couldn't give you, uh, you know, the proper M shape. They would just kind of fold it all over. And this is nicely made. It's just, you know, a bit difficult to use given the, the size of it. Anyway, you can try it if you want. Your mileage may vary. Once I have my plug crimped on, I like to wrap the wires together into one package. But I don't just wrap it straight in electrical tape. What I prefer to do is first wrap it in some foil and then wrap it in some tape. This accomplishes a few things. For one, it adds some bulk. Just like the string in the uh, other cable we saw, it just makes the whole bundle a bit more substantial. And in my opinion, delicate things just don't belong in the shop. So bulk is good, right? Uh, secondly, it makes the whole bundle a bit more rigid. So if you bend it in a position, it'll stay in roughly that position. Compare that to the pigtails here with these stranded wires that kind of just pull back every time and don't really take a shape when you bend them, you know? This is possibly easier to route. Uh, thirdly, if you have to service it and get to the conductors underneath, when you pull all that tape off, the residue stays in the foil. <laughs> the wires don't get sticky. And that alone is enough of a reason for me to want to wrap the wires before wrapping them in tape. Because we all know, you know, like when this motor gets hot and the wires get a bit toasty and the glue in here begins to melt, it will just become messy and awful. So if I have to get back to it underneath, the foil I can just toss and then the wires will still be clean and easy to work with. And that will be nice. Uh, now, there may also be some like mild shielding benefits of this, but I wouldn't really count on that given that we're not also grounding it. If you wanted to, you could get some copper wire, either stiff, you know, solid for uh, rigid, more rigidity or stranded for not, and then put that in the bundle and then ground that on the outside and kind of make uh, like a redneck shielded cable for yourself. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think there'd be much benefit to that on this right here because this is only six inches of cable and it won't be running directly along any signal wires we have. Uh, and then also by grounding this and turning it into that kind of shielded thing, you might accidentally be introducing a ground loop. I have to think more about that, but those are things that are best avoided. Keep in mind that when I talk about electrical engineering, I'm not an electrical engineer. Uh, I did physics in college, which is similar, but not really the same thing at all. And that was also several years ago. That means by now, I have forgotten basically everything I learned. Because <laughs> the fact of the matter is, no one will hire you to do physics when you can also write Python code. Even when you apply to a research lab, the moment they see minor in computer science on your resume, then you're done. You're toast, the jig is up, they know you can code, and that's your job. <sighs> but at least now from writing code, I'm familiar with Cunningham's Law, which says uh, the fastest way to learn the answer to something is to not ask the question, but to post the wrong answer. So I'm sure that if I see anything here that's egregiously wrong, somebody will correct me below in the comments, and probably loudly. In shielded cable, like this stuff here, this is a shielding. It's basically aluminum foil that covers all the conductors all the way down the cable. Kind of like what we added here. Uh, the difference is this also has some copper wire sticking out, making it easier to tie to ground. Now that basically gives you a grounded Faraday cage all the way down your wire, which is very good at isolating and keeping electromagnetic interference from either getting in or out. Uh, usually you use a shielded cable when you have a signal wire with a very uh, you know, small, like low voltage, low current signal that's uh, hard to detect, and it's getting interference from other nearby wires, creating false signals. As you might know, uh, just from like your day-to-day -day interactions with electronics, sometimes a wire with current flowing on it can actually induce current on another nearby wire. So for delicate signals, you know, you might mistakenly trip if you have something like a stepper motor, which puts out a lot of EMI. In our case, we're actually shielding the stepper motors themselves just to keep the EMI from ever getting out. And these things put out that interference because the stepper motor has the power uh, to its different pairs of coils turning off and on very, very rapidly as it steps. 
One thing you want to avoid when you're grounding your shielding is accidentally creating a ground loop. Let me try and explain. So this here will be the end uh, that goes to the drivers in a control cabinet. And this end will be going to the motors somewhere on the table. So if I ground the shielding here uh, in the control cabinet and here nearby the motor, I've created a loop at ground. Uh, you know, part of that's through the shielding on this cable and the other part is through the machine itself because it's made of steel. Now this big loop at ground, what that ends up doing is basically acting as a single loop transformer coil. So other current in the area um, from other machines running and that kind of stuff can actually induce a current in the loop, you know, on the machine and the shielding here. And that can then create EMI that can mess with delicate signals. Things like uh, the voltage reading for torch height control, or if you have a conductive uh, sensing for your torch tip when it touches the plate to get your correct Z offset before you begin to cut. You know, and those things can be uh, affected then by interference created by a ground loop. And from what I've heard, uh, these things can be very hard to debug and diagnose once you've done it by mistake. So just think about it when you're doing your wiring and know that's a thing to avoid. And if you're having any uh, strange issues, take a second look at your wiring and make sure that you didn't accidentally create uh, multiple paths through ground. So the way you usually solve this is by having only a single point where everything is grounded. You know, either like there, nearby your control cabinet, all your grounds go to one spot, and that way you can't have a loop. Anyway, I think that's all for now. So I'm gonna get back to wiring this stuff up and actually getting the machine running.